stories after the mission days, because during the mission times you weren't allowed to speak tongue, you weren't allowed to uh, process and tell stories about uh, our creation, you weren't uh, basically allowed to even love. Everything was arranged for you, your marriages. So uh, my mother comes from uh, New South Wales. She was sent up to that mission in the 40s because of the uh, White Australia policy times. And uh, she ended up marrying my dad. And as I said, it wasn't about love. It was about arrangements by the, by the superintendents or the uh, preachers at the time. And they thought that this uh, young man would be, be suited to that young girl. So they married him off. And they had mass marriages going on throughout the, uh, those days, which shaped the uh, communities that we do have up there today. Regardless of uh, what law you come from, whether it's right to marry that woman, she might be connected to you. And, uh, but these things weren't a lot, not allowed to be spoken about or even challenged in those days. So once that uh, mission broke down, we all started moving onto the banks of the Barren River on, on the three different little communities, Mantaka, Koroa, Koa, and another one called Mariba. So those areas where you'll find our people today. Now, when we got out, we had to face partialness. All our land, when my grandfathers went into that mission, they left a lush rainforest country. And when they came out of the mission, it was all Gone. Gone. They changed the face of the earth in our country. So it become unrecognizable to my grandfather, his father, and others around him around that same age. So growing up, it, it was hard. We had to put up with the, uh, the attitudes of the partialists, the very strict ways of Christianity. And uh, we were getting along doing that, growing up to be Christians and uh, doing as we're told until the late 60s, old band of kids came up from the cities. They called them hippies. And they arrived in Karanda, where I'm from. And I was thinking, who are these people? we never seen people like these before. And uh, they were rebellious. They were educated. And they were running away from something that they had enough of, which was the cities. And uh, they were friendly. Not, not unlike the, uh, the pastoralists up there at the time, all we were to them was... Uh, you bludging black bastards and uh, get out of here, you little thieves. So uh, those were the attitudes of the local white people. Well, then an influx of these uh, so-called hippies arrived. Now, hippies, they started uh, using our river systems and they started swimming around with no clothes and stuff like this. And I could only think for my grandfather who uh, he walked into that mission naked, told to keep his clothes on from there on, then come out, then within five years after being out of the mission system, we got white, so-called like uh, Aborigines running around naked on our riverbanks. And so these were different type of people, we thought. And they were, because they brought along different things like art, uh, creative things, music, and a different type of music. And that's where I got very interested in using music as a voice. I love music. So uh, 
I started uh, teaching myself how to play guitar. And the other instruments that I do play now, like the keyboards, the bass, the drums, and uh, they had music with them. They had the electronic gears. They had, uh, as I said, brains. And all that stuff, they made it. They made that stuff in Karanda. It was all made in the little houses. And we'd go along as, as younger ones and look at what they're doing and they'd share the interest with us. And I was asking a couple of the old, uh, couple of people from them, that group, to uh, if they could uh, lend us their gear so we could have something to play with. And so those group, they, they made us a full band set, a bass amp, a, a uh, guitar amp, a mixer. And it's all I made. And wow, from there, songwriting in another way began. We were so used to singing songs like, uh, that was on the radio, Patsy Cline, uh, Slim Dusty. You'd know all the old country and western songs that were on the radios in the days. So this is what we are growing up to. And now we started with our campaign with music. So I started writing songs about what was going on with our mob, our dreams, our hopes. And I didn't realise it was going to become popular or people started to love what we were doing and we become one of the most prominent forces of music in the country. We were supporting all the major acts in this land, the, uh, the, the red gums of the days, International acts like uh, UB40, um, Steel Pulse, NXS, Wendy Matthews, Eurogliders, Hunters and Collectors. I mean, I can keep on going. There's a lot of bands out there that uh, we've shared the stage with over the years. And the thing was to get our message out so when people plant the seed of unconsciousness in their minds about Aboriginal people and their struggles, I got a song called I Don't Want to Be No Slave. It's a song I wrote while I was working on the railways when I was younger. And uh, another song I got that many songs, I just. Uh, <laughs> The songs that we, like, I don't want to be no slave, get up, I say, like, they're building them houses, but where do we stay? Everybody, don't run away. We'll watch them come and we'll watch them go. So it's time for you to know. We'll get up and we'll stand up for our rights. Songs like that, that empowers our people to start singing. Other songs... Um, you knock me down, but I'll get up again. You can try and try again. You was my enemy, but now my friend. You'll knock me down, but I'll get up again. So what is, what is this you put in front of me? All your laws and your policies. They're made of glass, now I can see. Right through the other side, where the dark secrets hide, just like genocide. Lyrics like that is what I like to put and have installed into my song. So there's real meanings of the music and the lyrics of education and of value to our listeners. Our music is known to uh, heal people as well. We use it as a medicine. The same way like our ancestors used music, singing, dancing. The band was so good in organising meetings up there when we had to get together and talk about issues in the community, particularly with the police. The police were our number one enemies. And uh, you'll see that uh, even today, in a lot of our smaller communities, they still are our number one enemies. The way they go around and uh, chastise our children 
force them to do things that they don't want to do, then brand them criminals. And when we do get good police, they shift them on out. The police that were getting very close to us and close to our kids and, and uh, start doing the right thing, they don't seem to like that. Don't know why, when I thought the police were there to serve and protect. But uh, again, with music, you can see by the travelling that we do around the country, the music has taken us into areas where we never ever would have went before, up into the Northern Territories. And uh, I can remember going to Barunga for the first time. And we were driving along the highway and then the rest of the boys in the band started getting excited because we seen the lights up ahead. Oh, here we go, we're getting close. And then we come up close and there's a massive big police station sitting in the middle of the bush. We're thinking, what is here? What's this, this for? Oh, yeah. This is not for the people. This is to protect the mines. You know, straight up, we've seen it. Just flash before our eyes. This is not for us. This is for the protection of the mines. And if they're there, we're for us, you know, like uh, the place being a better state. So, music was our way, and still is our way, to keep people, minds open and conscious, and make them feel good about themselves while they're listening to this message. And to use it as a tool that way, I find it uh, very pleasing because there's no better feeling after you've done a, uh, a great performance, everyone enjoyed what you've done, and uh, you know that your job has been done when people are singing your lyrics and walking away with that seed that you planted in their, in their minds just from them listening to your music. Music was the uh, first stage of us becoming used to being up on a stage. From there, we'd done a couple of major tours with the band in the early 80s. We were on our way to Melbourne in 1984. We couldn't get down because of the, the old Hume Highway was all iced up and there were major accidents along the road. We only made it far as uh, Canberra. We were here to see another Aboriginal band off on their very first international tour. No fixed address, they were on their way to uh, England. So uh, we we're, were coming down to show our support. We didn't make it, so we ended up going back home the long way. And uh, the members of the band said, listen, we've got to do something about our culture. It's disappearing. So uh, the members of a band, we started the very first dance group back up there then. So we put the guitars down for a little while and then picked up the, the tap sticks and the boomerangs. And we started a venture there. We started the uh, Jabba Guy Dance Theatre up in Karanda. The dance theatre, again, was a, uh, a project we put together just to save our culture and to start on our language preservation, documenting our language and using the modern tools now that are available to us, like books. The computer wasn't really out then yet and uh, none of us were used to that. So it's just a way of us promoting ourselves as, as, a, uh, as a group, as, as a Aboriginal tribe or Bumman, Bummer. We call ourselves Bummers up there, Aboriginal people, Bummer. So, many times I think about those days, that theatre, it became so popular and it became one of the biggest things that ever hit our town. 
we employed over 70 people, all on above award wages. So we changed the face of the town just with uh, the perseverance of what we thought we had to do to keep ourselves alive. If we weren't doing something that was shaped and designed around our culture, we'd just simply uh, wither away and become a victim of, of this, uh, I call it, divide and conquer process. And you feel that when you're in a position like we are, like uh, you call us activists, you call us uh, freedom fighters, we didn't, um, wake up one day and say, well, I, this is what I'm going to be. You know, some of us are just born into it and you are coached along the way by your friends and people who trust and love you. And love is, is the biggest drive of the activist movement. So when you touch the word love, that's where it should be there with activists. That runs along with activism. If it wasn't for the love of our country, of our people, for each other, for the land, for the waters, for the animals, we would not be doing what we're doing. And love is the only thing that can push us all through. No matter what nation you're from, what people you come from what country you come from. If you got love, love conquers all. I've seen that, I've witnessed that, and I know that. As a kid, I was sent up to these uh, old ladies up in Mariba on the school holidays, and one of the old ladies used to buy my school books she sponsored my schooling for me. So, she sponsored my schooling and uh, she said, boy, when you go to school, I want you to learn and you learn good. And what you learn, you bring them back to your people. So I've always kept it in mind, going through high school, Going through the examinations, I was surprised that, uh, of all things, I got the highest marks in English at the whole high school, and uh, nearly up there with mathematics as well. So, history, well, I wasn't too much interested in the history we were being taught, so and there was something wrong with that, I thought. So, the real history is yet to come. It's still yet to come about who we are as a nation of indigenous or the tribes that we have here on this land, the truth is still yet to unfold. The out of Africa theme, we, um, they'll turn that one around. As long as they give more emphasis on the people, first nations of this land. But with the music I say, I was, um, you seen other bands come through Yoti Yindi, we all know that song, Treaty. And uh, not many after Yoti Yindi. Um, we have Stacy, Tracy Donovan, and uh, she's doing well. But for a lot of us, we like to see the, the real essence of uh, Aboriginal spirituality come out through the music as well. And using our language, the language is the other big breaker. People don't realise that in this country we had over nearly 300 different languages. In my area up there we have six, just around the Cairns area. We got my language, Bulwanji, there's Yabaganji, Gunganji, Yuraganji, Najan, Jangan. Mularuji, 
and Yirinji. These are different languages. So being multi-tongue with languages was a natural thing for any Aboriginal child of the days, speaking many languages. And these are things now that music is a way that we bring it back together. We start writing songs in languages now to help revive the language because a lot of kids and their parents uh, just don't, you know, they've been disconnected, properly disconnected. So getting the dance back, the, the theatre proved to be a very successful, it still runs today, it is now in Cairns, down the bottom of the mountain, it's called the uh, Jabagai Cultural Park. Now it comes to the land management side, this is where I find myself today as I get older and uh, getting back onto the country and looking after country, looking after our art sites. We have uh, rock art sites, in the rainforest rock art sites. Our art is, so, is different to art just um, 200 kilometres away up in the Laura area where you've got the world's greatest, largest collection of art. And, uh, you know, you could, one man can't get through that old, look at any of them art up there in his whole lifetime if he's tried to study them art up there. And, this, and it shows you how long our people was on this land, just through the art and the stories that come. Again, we have scarred trees. We have trees that are, have messages on them. We have the old tracks, the old boar rings are still there intact. So these are the things that are of great concerns for people like myself and I'm sure the other leaders in the communities that um, again love our ancestors, who love our culture and don't like to see it be forgotten. Right now, the uh, Queensland government has just announced that they want to uh, inject a lot of money into um, Indigenous tourism. So, uh, me and a few friends, just only a couple of weeks ago, we started uh, Tuesday night meetings. On, on the Tuesday nights, we'll get together and uh, we'll bring the community in and uh, say, well, what can we do? How can we go about it? Creating a, a another venture for ourselves outside of the dance because uh, everyone knows we can dance now. I mean, that dance theater is well over 30 years old so, and they're still running, so that, that's a statement for itself. And, uh, but there's more. But, but the thing is, with us, we don't like to give it all away. We'll give you little pieces. We'll give you a little taste of who we and what we're about. Unless you come and live with us and spend some time with us, you'll start to feel and know the impact that each individual group around this country is going through. Like our dilemmas that are going on up there in the rainforest could be quite different to what's going on in the deserts, you know, and vice versa. We have different water issues, different upper, and we've got no problems with water. Our water's never run out. We count ourselves quite lucky in that area. So, so country is so important. The singing of country, the singing of the animals, the timing of birds. And then with land management, we look at the way this country has been burning. I was down here nine years ago with Victor Stephenson, who was on Q&A um, Monday before last. We came down to promote fire and the story, the story about fire and how 
land management is so crucial to the future of this country. You got a healthy country, you can have healthy people. And if you got a sick country, the people are going to be sick too. So what we do is try and promote all the healthiness and, and the good sides of our, our culture to benefit all people of this land. Not just uh, our race, but all the other races that have come and to live with us here. Because if we don't listen and take the advice of the old, our ancestors, and do the practices of our ancestors, we're in for a bumpy ride into the future. This country is only uh, 200 years under uh, a lot less up north. As I told you, it's only 100 years up north. That's why we still got a good grip on our fire management up there. But please, you know, got to get a message out to your, uh, to your uh, representative bodies and uh, convince them to look back at it, the indigenous land management. It's, you know, like uh, we, we talk amongst ourselves with our families and we just say, I can't imagine. I, I can never, never imagine in my life facing a fire that high. Because it never happened. It just never happened. We're so used to walking through fires that are running this high. You know, kids get involved, but children get involved with it. It's the teaching of it all. Of, of uh, it's, it's a day out. It's, it's like when you're hunting as well. Kids get involved, they, you know, this is where they learn all about the animals. The inside, the makeup of it all. So, once again, the music, I believe, is, is a tool that shaped me into the direction where I continue to go today. And if it wasn't for music, I wouldn't be here today. So, uh, thank you for your ears, everybody. I think. Um, my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Does anybody have any questions for Willie Brim? Uh, we have one just over here. I'd like first to say to thank the organizers for inviting Willie Brim here. Thank you so much. It's beautiful insight into, into Australia, into the heart of Australia. Um, Willie, it's a pleasure to learn more about all this dancing, music, all this development you did to yourself um, to be able to bridge or to connect with, um, with life after change. Mm. Um, what I'd like to ask you, you've mentioned a few languages that you're trying to uh, get your kids at the community to be able not to forget and to remember. Um, actually, I have two branches of questions. The first one is, um, is there a common language that everyone could understand, one? And number two, uh, when you spoke about um, uh, tourism, in indigenous tourism, uh, there is a huge amount of ideas that, um, uh, you know, in indigenous tourism can capture for either people in Australia uh, who doesn't know much about your um, your core and, and the changes that happen and how you modified all these generations among these changes and also for tourists uh, who comes to Australia looking forward to learn more about your lifestyle. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, with the uh, tourism, I mean, the interest is there from the people who come to this country when they come to visit. And... Unfortunately, we're going to deal with the tourism board. And up in Queensland, they like to uh, not really give us a fair go. So it's like the dance theatre experience. We, we, we had to get private sector 
who'd gamble on the, that this is going to work. And then, you know, we proved that gamble was a worthy gamble. And uh, otherwise, the people, it, it, it cost money. And we didn't have money. And, and people just invested a, a few thousand bucks each from our local people. And uh, again, these were the hippies that threw in. And they didn't want anything back from the shares. I mean, that place generated, uh, with, within, uh, within three and a half years, it started generating millions a year. So, and then in return, that just went back to the wages of the people who worked there. And, and the, the uh, CEO at the time, he decided that uh, everyone de deserves Christmas bonuses and stuff like this, stuff we never heard of before. You know, and uh, wow. And as for the language again, now there isn't one language that all of Australia, but just through my uh, experience, I'm, I'm sure that uh, there are some common words like Murrah, hand, Jinnah, foot. Yeah, that, those two are the most I find. I use almost everywhere, you know. But as for everything else, nah, it's like French is to English. You know, you can go, I can go up uh, 40 miles from me and I just can't understand what they're on about. <laughs> yeah, and it's like when they come home too. And we sit down and start talking. You know, they'd be sitting there, like, wondering what we're talking about. Un unless, you know, you're married into or, or, and then you'll get a chance to learn that language. Yeah. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more quick question. Does anybody have a question in the one audience? One more fairly quick question. Yep. Yeah, I'm on my brother. You yeah, mentioned bro. there about our singing has enabled a lot of our younger activists, performers that are coming through. And you met my nephew there, um, Mitch Tambo. You know, that's what we have to do, bring back those stories, culture, song, dance on a contemporary form. Do you see that happening a lot in the future? And what was the last bit there? I see it happening where? All, all, all over Australia, with a lot more of our young black performers coming through and in and being proud and embracing their long language, song, dance and stories and performing it on stage? Well, to tell you the truth, I met a young, uh, he gave me a CD last night at the supper there and uh, I'm so proud of that young man because uh, I was sitting on the weekend with my wife and we were watching uh, Eurovision. <laughs> yes, and uh, I'm a musician, don't forget. And, uh, and it, it was a pleasure to see this young fella get up there and sing. All in language and, and pumping it out from his heart. You know, no one else could understand what he's singing about. But then I was singing to myself while he was singing, he belongs in Europe. That music needs to go to Europe to calm those people down over there. <laughs> yes. If, if you heard what happened to Gurumu, when this music went to Europe, I mean, the traffic, they played this music during our peak hour traffic, and peak hour wasn't the same. It was so smooth. And it, again, it shows you the, the effects of music, what it can do to the mind and the soul. So, uh, yes, uh, bro, I mean... I'd encourage any young musician to get up there and, and sing and, and to spread their message, even if it's through language, you could always uh, have it translated later, you know, on your subtitling. Mm. So people do know what he's singing about or she's singing about. And it is a useful tool to show that we are of this country and of our tribal content and who we are. Like our language is our identity card, really. I actually do have one more question, Willie. Where can we get your CD? Um, 
I only bought a couple of CDs down, but uh, they were just uh, strictly for friends. So uh, if you're lucky to get one, there might be a couple up there left. Um, you can look online under Zenith. And uh, personally, uh, my old band that, that I've started back in the 70s, we reformed because our, our community was getting into uh, a, a crazy way. All the young people started attacking each other and uh, losing respect for each other. So me and the old boys, we got, we got the band back together and it changed the community again. Just through the songs like, uh, how are you, my brother? How are you today? You know, like songs like this and uh, meaningful songs that you're talking to each other. You know, let's go and sit down under a tree and talk. And, you know, it's songs like that that, that does shape people and uh, make them feel good about themselves. Thank you very much, everybody. Let's hear it for Willie Broom.